Good evening, everybody. Uh, have you all signed your life away on the <laughs> witness and everything? Um, the, um, the, the topic uh, tonight on uh, international criminal justice um, might, might seem a bit odd for uh, what is supposed to be a short course on human rights. And I want to just spend a few minutes uh, kind of positioning it within, within human rights, why it would be, why it would even be in a human rights course talk about this uh, body of law, which is somewhat distinct from, from human rights, uh, how it's related, and maybe if there are any difficulties with the relationship between, um, I guess, what people call international criminal law, or ICL, they like, they like acronyms, I hate them, I won't say <laughs> ICL again, but people know ICL, um, and uh, certainly uh, international criminal law as a discipline or as a field, uh, has been around longer than international human rights law. You could find this out by doing a Google book a search, and you could do a, a search on human rights law or international international human rights law, and you'd find that it's clearly a 20th century creation, whereas the idea of international criminal law, the term, I did, some, I did this Google book search and found that the term uh, was actually uh, first used in the middle of the 19th century. But of course, when it was used in the middle of the 19th century, it was used to describe um, what uh, in French they would call uh, droit pénal uh, international, in other words, the uh, criminal law in its international ramifications, more like conflicts, more like the relationship between national legal systems in the criminal law sphere uh, in matters like extradition, international Legal, mutual legal assistance and so on, more about that than about creating international institutions and creating a body of, of international law, which is what we have in the 21st century, uh, uh, defining offenses and, of course, the final uh, crowning piece of all the creation of the International Criminal Court. But uh, international <coughs> human rights law uh, didn't engage with the international criminal law in its early years uh, after the, the Second World War. And uh, I can recall now, seems like a long time ago, I'm old, 30 years ago, studying law, where we looked at the Nuremberg Tribunal uh, very summarily. We didn't really know what to make of it. There wasn't a theory about the Nuremberg Tribunal. There was a sense that there was something a bit odd and troublesome about it, that maybe it was victor's justice, maybe it was um, that bad guys were punished as a result, but there was sort of a stigma about it that was, it was just a, an ambiguous kind of an event. And of course that has changed, and I don't want to leave anybody with the impression that I have, uh, uh, that I'm uncomfortable about the Nuremberg Tribunal, because I think it was a great, a great event. Uh, and, but I came to adopt that view uh, many years after I had become engaged with international rights and made that um, central to my academic work and my own engagement, my own commitment. Um, sometime, I think in the middle, sometime in the 1980s, human rights law started to shift its focus from being um, entirely loyal to the defendant in a criminal trial, and to the prisoner in detention. Uh, we went from being suspicious of criminal justice to embracing it as a tool for the promotion of human rights. But I think, uh, I, I can think of no better example if we were to think back 40 or 50 years ago. I mean, the, the premier human rights NGO of them all is called Amnesty. And today, I think that if Amnesty International had to start from scratch, that word wouldn't even be on the shortlist as a name for the organization. Because, of course, Amnesty International has, is opposed to Amnesty's and has adopted position papers on Amnesty's. But, you know, the name reflected an attitude at the time that viewed criminal justice and viewed the, the, the aftermath of criminal justice, that is, a detention system, um, with a great uh, trepidation. And uh, it was only later that, that the, the, the wind shifted on this. Of course, the idea was always there, 
And you know, I'll mention this uh, latest uh, project that I was engaged in on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I have assembled basically all of the UN documents on the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in three volumes. It's more than 3,000 pages long. And so in the course of doing it, I became familiar with all of the debates that went on in 1946 and 47 and 48 about the universal, about codifying human rights. Um, and uh, the idea that there was a punitive dimension was present, but it was very present. The idea that we now know as being very important in human rights law, what, what we call the procedural obligation, uh, especially with regard to Articles 2 and 3 of the European Convention, the idea that states are under an obligation to investigate and prosecute violations of the right to life and threats to bodily integrity like torture. This, has been, this is now very well rooted in our law, but fairly recent. I mean, the, 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 the turning point in the European Court's case law on this is the McCann, McCann versus UK case, 1995, I think, from memory, and McCann was released, first of all, it's the first right to life decision of the European Court of Human Rights, and of course it's there that they uh, developed this idea that, that's now very well accepted and defined in all kinds of decisions of the European Court about both Articles 2, 3, I guess a little bit about Article 8 as well, the European Convention. Am I, am I using too much shorthand to refer to articles? Everybody knows. Right to life, Article 2. Uh, protection against torture and inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment, Article 3. And protection of the right to private and family life, Article 8. Uh, and, but, but that emerges, I think, that those ideas start to emerge in the 1980s. We actually see it earlier in the inter-American system than we do in the European system with the Velasquez Rodriguez decision of the, of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which dates to 1988. And we start to see work in the sort of the think tanks of international human rights. I'm talking in particular about the old subcommission on the prevention of discrimination and the protection of minorities, which was abolished with the UN reform in 2006, but operated as kind of a think tank, a ginger group, as a place where new and sometimes provocative views of human rights could be debated and developed. And so you start to see a little bit of that work in the, in the subcommission in the 1980s as well. And then that all informs uh, this uh, new phase of international criminal justice, which has been, by this point, by 1990, lying dormant for about 40 years, uh, really since the end of the, of the since the post-war. Uh, experiments, the post-war efforts at international justice. I'm speaking particularly of the Nuremberg trial, but maybe a couple of other pieces that have to be mentioned. The Genocide Convention of 1948. Uh, some have called the Genocide Convention the first human rights treaty of the United Nations. Uh, it's adopted uh, the day before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights on the 9th of December 1948. Uh, it's about the protection of minorities from the ultimate threat to their existence, which is their extermination, their destruction. Uh, it's very much a part of the tradition of the protection of minority rights that was, that was one of the early uh, manifestations of human rights law. I'm talking now of the post-First World War period, the interwar years and the minorities treaties. So uh, genocide is, 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 is in that uh, spirit, you could say, and of course the Genocide Convention also is the launching point of the Permanent International Criminal Court, because when the Convention is being adopted in 1947 and 1948, there are interesting discussions about where the crime of genocide can be prosecuted. And uh, many states say, well, we should entrench universal jurisdiction in the Genocide Convention. We should recognize that there's universal jurisdiction for genocide in the Convention, and there's fierce opposition to this from many states. Just to mention two of them, two of them maybe the most important at the time, the Soviet Union and the United States. The Soviet Union is 
terrified that some American prosecutor is going to start prosecuting them for genocide. And the United States is terrified that some Soviet prosecutor is going to start prosecuting Soviet leaders for genocide. And so they say, no way. No universal jurisdiction. It's not just that they forgot it or that they were silent on the subject. If you look at the drafting history, you see that they voted it down. They rejected universal jurisdiction very clearly. And uh, they agreed in its place to recognize what's always seemed to be an aberration in the Genocide Convention. Purely territorial jurisdiction. In other words, genocide can only be prosecuted by the state where the crime was committed. This is Article Six of the Genocide Convention, but there's also the suggestion that genocide can be prosecuted by an international criminal court yet to be created. And at the time the resolution with the convention was adopted on the 9th of December, it, there actually there's a package of resolutions that are adopted uh, that, that is adopted on that day, and one of them uh, begins the process of drafting a statute that becomes the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. And, and that process goes on for a few years in the late 40s and the early 1950s, and then it stalls. So when international justice revives in the basically the late 80s or the early 90s, um, it's been dormant, essentially dormant, for about 40 years, um, while the human rights law was slowly gaining momentum. So although international criminal law, as I say, I went to I studied international human rights law 30 years ago. We didn't study international criminal law. It wasn't on the agenda. It wasn't part of it. There were no courses. There were no books on the subject, really. Um, human rights law, on the other hand, was, was slowly gaining momentum. So 30 years ago, there were 30 or 40 judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. It was so easy then. Now there are about 30 or 40 a week. Um, but there were 30 or 40 altogether in the early 80s, and so you could, you could get a grip on it. The Human Rights Committee has, was just starting its activity. But international criminal law was still fast asleep in hibernation. We didn't know that then, but it turns out it was just in hibernation. <coughs> and as I said earlier, the, the, the human rights law, it's, it's change in focus, and I don't know why this happened. I, I don't have an explanation, I don't have a theory, about why, but let's just say that it happened, that human rights law became increasingly uh, engaged with the idea that you protect human rights by prosecuting and punishing people who violate human rights. Um, that, that I'm convinced that this contributes very much to the, the revival of international criminal law in the 1990s. People often also say that this was a result of the uh, end of the Cold War. The Cold War had made it impossible for international criminal law to progress, particularly the project of the International Criminal Court. And I think that's also true. And I think that it's distinct from the human rights idea. And those two factors, the end of the Cold War and the political transformations that go on at the end of the Cold War and the growth of human rights, both contribute to the development of international criminal law uh, to the International Criminal Court. And I think that there's a tension between them that is responsible for some of the challenges that we face in international criminal justice. One other area in which international uh, human rights law becomes very important in the development of international criminal law is in the content of the crimes. And if you, if you return to Nuremberg and look at the subject matter jurisdiction of the Nuremberg Tribunal and what was considered to be the substance, the, the content of international criminal law in the 1940s. Uh, it was still afflicted with features of the old law in the sense that it was about reciprocal rights between states. You prosecuted Nazi war criminals because they had done bad things to your nationals. It wasn't about the human the human being, but it was about the injury to people who were associated with the state. Of course, there are, there are changes, there's an evolution in it, and we start to see that at Nuremberg, not with regard to war crimes particularly, uh, not with regard to the crime of crimes against peace, which today we call the crime of aggression. That too was about an injury done by one state to another. We start to see it 
but, but very much in, in, in its birth pangs with crimes against humanity. And there are fascinating discussions that go on. Uh, I, I was at a conference here in London at SOAS uh, a few months ago where we were, we, we, the conference was on the United Nations War Crimes Commission, which met here in London, uh, mainly in 1944, to prepare uh, the groundwork for the post-war prosecutions. And it, was, it had been created by the major powers in the late, in late 1943. Uh, it was set up to meet here in London, but there was a broader participation. So, besides the United Kingdom and the United States and France, it also contained the Free Czechs, the Poles, um, the New Zealand, Australia, India, a number of other states that were here and that were present with diplomatic representatives here in London during the war. Um, they get to the first meeting in January of 1944, and people say, well, what are you going to do about the uh, atrocities committed against the Jews in Germany? And the answer from the British Foreign Office in January of 1944 is, well, we're not going to do anything about that because that's not covered by international law. What the, what the Germans do to Jews in Germany doesn't concern us. It's a matter for domestic law. Uh, the Americans uh, very much share that position, but, but the view evolves over the course of 1944 uh, uh, into and by, by early 1945 it's accepted that these atrocities that have been committed by the Nazis not only in occupied territories but against their own nationals in their own country cannot be left unpunished and so at a subsequent gathering in June and July of 1945 where the smaller countries I include India as one of the smaller countries. I don't mean smaller in size, I just mean in terms of its muscle, its, its political muscle at the meeting. It's only the big countries that are there. So it's just the United Kingdom, France, the United States, and the Soviet Union who were at the London Conference, which meets from late June until actually early August of 1945. And it prepares the architecture of the Nuremberg Tribunal. And there they have these fascinating debates, and we also we have the records of the debates where um, they, Robert Jackson, the American prosecutor, says, we agree with prosecutor, the Nazis, for the atrocities committed against their own people. I mean, this is human rights, right? For their, their own persecution of their own population. He said, we agree with doing this, but only to the extent that it's connected to the war. So, because if there's no connection to the war, we really have no interest in that. And, and Jackson, who I think I have a lot of uh, admiration for, he was a Roosevelt Democrat, he was a fine justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, and he was rather candid. And he said, well, the reason why is because uh, we have in our own country, he said, problems of persecution of minorities. And he said, we don't want to create a body of law where we could be held responsible for that at, as a violation of international law. <coughs> and uh, I, the others don't really react, although I, I would have loved to have been a, a fly on the wall in that, in that meeting, you know, and, uh, you know, the uh, French guy sitting there scratching his head saying, well, now that you mention it, I mean, uh, what about Indochina and Algeria and French West Africa and the representative of the foreign office is thinking, you know, India and Aden and Cyprus and Jamaica and so on, and of course the Soviet is thinking about Chechnya and the Chechnya and all kinds of interesting, the Katyn massacre and, you know, various uh, difficulties they all have. So they tracked the concept of crimes against humanity. They limited with this, what we call the war nexus. But it's the germ, it's the, it's the, what we're seeing germinate there <laughs> is human rights in the international criminal law sphere. And that too sits dormant. It's like a seed that hasn't, it, 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 it's then left for 40 years. And then things really are transformed in the 1990s. And so the substance of international law, of international criminal law, changes because the crimes expand. And they expand primarily in two ways in the 1990s. The link between crimes against humanity and war is definitively removed. And what this means then is that henceforth crimes against humanity covers 
the whole spectrum of human rights violations in peacetime. You could look at the definition of crimes against humanity in the Rome Statute, and it reads like a list of human rights violations. The language is borrowed from human rights treaties, much of it. So we have value and forced disappearance, apartheid, torture, uh, the, the terminology and everything. It's all informed by human rights law. And essentially, that's what it is. It's prosecuting um, gross and systematic, to use the human rights vernacular, gross and systematic violations of human rights Crimes against humanity, we'll call them widespread or systematic attacks on a civilian population. But fundamentally, it's the same thing. The other thing that changes is that war crimes have become liberated from the restriction to war crimes in an international armed conflict, which is what was being prosecuted in Nuremberg. And that opens up as well the prospect of, of dealing with atrocities committed in internal armed conflict. And, and so we all of a sudden now we have a body of law that's much better adapted to dealing with uh, uh, with human rights violations, essentially, in peacetime or in a civil war, in an internal armed conflict. And I think that's largely why the human rights movement embraces this, this development. Uh, we even take some new crimes that are pretty much borrowed from new human rights instruments. I'm thinking particularly about recruitment of child soldiers, the, the recruitment, the cons enlistment, conscription, and uh, active use of child soldiers, which, although it has some origins also in the law of armed conflict, in the two um, additional protocols to the Geneva Convention of 1977, is mainly about the provision of provision in the Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, of 1989. So this Nobody has any doubt by the time we get to the 1990s about this very close relationship between human rights law and international criminal law. And as I say, the, um, the human rights NGOs in particular absolutely embrace these developments, the creation of the ad hoc tribunals and then in particular the creation of the International Criminal Court. There are nevertheless some points of tension. One of them is of course, where we obviously encounter tension with human rights law, dealing with the fairness of the trials and the procedures. And there's a, still a lot of, I think, a lot of unease about some of the perceived things that, that we would have found shocking and unacceptable at the domestic level, and that sometimes we just sort of hold our nose at the international level and think are um, ex acceptable. The other uh, area where we have difficulties with human rights law, where I guess there's a challenge that's posed. And this is the, sort of the second theme of my remarks, which is also speaking to what I, I think is some of the crisis in international human rights law today. Um, during the 1990s, as the International Criminal Court was being developed, there is a, uh, uh, an, an initial plan for an international criminal court that comes from the International Law Commission. The International Law Commission, which is a subsidiary body of the UN General Assembly, it's alleged, it's what they call an expert body, euphemistically, because some of the people, although they are no doubt highly talented experts, are also not really far removed from the governments who have nominated them and got them elected. So it's, it's technically an expert body, but sometimes it looks like uh, it looks a bit too, it's a bit too cozy with some states, and it's traditionally quite a conservative body because many of those people are former legal advisors uh, of government. I mean, the current member for the UK is former legal advisor, uh, Sir Michael Wood. Um, a fine lawyer, by the way, I don't mean to say anything negative about him, but let's just say that, you know, you work for the government for many years and you develop reflexes of loyalty and, and, uh, and conservatism. And so it, it is a conservative body, and it was even more so 20 years ago, when it was finalizing the draft statute of the International Criminal Court. The draft statute that it proposed was for, of an institution that was very much like the Yugoslavia and Rwanda tribunals. Yugoslavia tribunal had actually already been created in May of 1993, and the International Law Commission finalized its draft. Um, in 1994, 
So it, it already had the benefit. There was a bit of a synergy, actually, between the Security Council, which was developing the statute of the Yugoslavia Tribunal, and the International Law Commission. So the International Law Commission had a draft. The Security Council lawyers looked at it when they were drafting the statute of the Yugoslavia Tribunal. And then, then the Yugoslavia Tribunal statute came back to influence the final draft of the International Law Commission. The main point in that statute was that the Security Council basically was in charge. It was a permanent version of the Yugoslavia Tribunal. It was an institution that, although it might be in, legally independent of the Security Council, and that it might, and this wasn't resolved yet, it might not be a UN body, finally it isn't a UN body, but that authorization to proceed with prosecution would essentially depend on the blessing of the Security Council. The Security Council would have to give a green light for any prosecution. And so, uh, in terms of its selection of priorities, of, its, of, it, of the case selection, the situations that it would prosecute, this would obviously be controlled by the permanent members of the Security Council. Um, many people, after when the Yugoslavia Tribunal was created, said, what a great progressive development. Now we have a tribunal that's independent, that's created by the international community, this wonderful euphemism we use, the international community. I, I, I keep trying to urge a doctoral student to study what the international community is. I don't even know if anyone's written an article about it, but uh, you know, I, I keep looking for the website of the international community. I can't find it. I have an idea who belongs to it. I know a few people who don't. I don't know that Iran is. Maybe they are now a member of the international community. North Korea is certainly not really a member of the international community. But uh, you know, Washington and London are surely members of the international community. And maybe it has a you know, an inner circle as well of powerful countries. Be that as it may, um, the, the Yugoslavia Tribunal finally was created by the same people who created the Nuremberg Tribunal. France, the UK, the United States, and the USSR. With a few little political transformations, the Chinese are present. They weren't too interested in Nuremberg, because it was Europe. They weren't too interested in Yugoslavia either, because it was Europe. They basically said, you four, you did it before in 1945, you know what you're doing, do it, do it again. I'm not saying there were no improvements, but they were incremental, and ultimately it was a politically captive institution. So the idea is then saying, let's create something that is uh, similar to that, but permanent. Uh, an empty vessel that the Security Council can then fill from time to time when it serves its purpose. That was the vision of the International Law Commission. And what happens between 1994, when the International Law Commission finishes its draft, and 1998, when the Rome Statute is adapted, adopted, is that that becomes unhinged. That that close bond and that close control over the court by the Security Council becomes greatly loosened. Not removed. It's not, it's not entirely removed. And some states still unhappy that, that that didn't fully take place, but it becomes detached. And two arguments are responsible for this, so two trends. One of them is the, the new political environment that results from the end of the Cold War, and the other is the human rights uh, argument. So when I mentioned in the 1980s, the revival of this idea of dealing with impunity and of international criminal justice, and I said there were, there were two factors. There was the end of the Cold War and the, the, the new interest in human rights law in impunity. I think those two components also inform this development in the International Criminal Court. Let me explain what I mean by that. The human rights community, the NGOs, Amnesty International in particular, maybe some people here knew the late Christopher Hall, who worked at Amnesty International for 20 years on the subject of, of the International Criminal Court, and very sadly passed away earlier this year, and uh, made a huge contribution here uh, to, to this uh, development of this. And, he, and others, and the other human rights NGOs, and human rights academics said, you can't have a court that is controlled in this way by a political body, because 
kind of a new part. Article 14 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 6 of the European Convention. You can't, you have to have an independent court. That's the only vision of a court that's compatible with modern human rights. So it's a, it's a very seductive human rights argument based on principles of independence and impartiality. And how do you get that? Well, we're not worried about the judges, because the judges even at Nuremberg and in the Yugoslavia tribunal are independent and impartial. It's about the prosecutor. It's just about the prosecutor. The prosecutor at Nuremberg is an independent and impartial. Well, there are four prosecutors at Nuremberg. Uh, they're all appointed by their governments. They're not elected by any body. They're just named by the governments. And we know now there's more archival research about it. They're also getting instructions from their governments. They, they have, there was a committee of the, in the Foreign Office to supervise the work of the British prosecutor at Nuremberg. Uh, Robert Jackson said that he was more independent because he was a, a friend of Truman's and they trusted him. But, but certainly if Jackson had come in one day and said, I think that, you know, I've been looking at the Second World War again and I really think we have to prosecute the people who dropped the bomb on Hiroshima as well. Uh, he would have been very quickly uh, replaced by, because, and there was no doubt that he could be replaced by the U.S. Um, at the Yugoslavia Tribunal, the statute says the prosecutor is independent. Well, yeah, it says the prosecutor is independent. The prosecutor is in, independent of the government, in a strict sense. It doesn't take instructions from the government. But the prosecutor is elected by the Security Council. And uh, the statute doesn't say how the prosecutor can be removed. Um, if you were a really independent prosecutor, you'd say, well, now I know how I got the job. Now can you just tell me where the red line is that I can't cross? Because I need to know where that is uh, in case, you know, because I don't want to cross it, but I want to know how independent I am. And they never tell the prosecutor that at the, at the Yugoslavia Tribunal. So the current prosecutor, Serge Bramwitz, he came in one day and said, you know, I, I, I'm fed up with prosecuting the Serbs and the Croats, and this is, uh, I, I think we should really turn our fire on Sri Lanka and prosecute Rajapaksa. And uh, there'd be a hastily convened Security Council meeting, and he would lose his job within about three hours, I think. Um, so, not really independent as a prosecutor. So what we're talking about at the International Criminal Court, and what the human rights NGOs and the human rights academics want, is an independent prosecutor who can take those decisions um, himself or herself. At the same time, you have something else that's going on, which is you have a, a group of states, small and medium-sized powers from different parts of the world, some of them quite rich and powerful, like Germany, some of them smaller, and but, but nevertheless politically influential, South Africa, Argentina, and so on, a whole group of them, who don't really like the post-war configuration of the United Nations, the Charter, the Security Council, the five permanent members, they don't really like this. They can't make any headway in reforming the Security Council, and reforming the Charter, and so they think maybe we'll do indirectly what we can't quite do directly. And they look at this international criminal justice system and say, let's snatch it out of the hands of the Security Council, the people who run it in the past, let's snatch it out of their hands and, you know, their, so their desire, it, it wasn't driven by the idea of the, by this, this very attractive human rights vision of an independent and impartial tribunal. It was simply get it out of the control of those people, but without a clear idea of who would control it, who would give it political direction. <clears throat> and so those two trends, those two streams, link up. They get kind of merged together, and the result is they get a lot of energy, and they largely succeed. Uh, at the, and that's the Rome Statute. It's the great development of the Rome Statute. It's the most single, important change in the Rome Statute from everything about international criminal justice prior to the Rome Statute. It's a court with general jurisdiction, in theory with jurisdiction over everything that happens on the planet today. Because although uh, it, it can only today actively exercise jurisdiction over the states, their territories, and their nationals who join the court and a few others because of Security Council resolution, 
It's possible. We can look at a situation like Syria and say, the court could operate there. I mean, the prosecutor should have a file on their desk about Syria because the Security Council could give her Syria. The Security Council could give her Sri Lanka. Uh, Security Council or Palestine could give her the West Bank and the settlements. I mean, all of that's possible. It's theoretically possible, even if it's not uh, if it's not immediately realistic. So it's a court that operate anywhere. And who decides now where it prosecutes? Well, if I was doing this talk about the International Criminal Court uh, ten years ago, I would have said, well, there are three ways that that that, that those that the targets for prosecution of the International Criminal Court are identified. One is by the Security Council adopting a resolution. The Security Council can adopt a resolution, it's Article 13b, saying, and they've done it twice now, once for Darfur and once for Libya, saying, this is where the court should prosecute. And a state party, that's Article 14 of the Rome Statute, it can also make a declaration saying, we trigger, this is the term we use, the jurisdiction of the court. We want the court to prosecute in this place. And we have some of those. Uh, Uganda was the first. President Museveni triggered the jurisdiction unexpectedly against Uganda. Well, he didn't really trigger it against Uganda. He triggered it against the Lord's resistance army, against his enemies. Um, and then we've had similar uh, declarations in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and the uh, Central African Republic. And now, now, so th there are uh, uh, states can trigger the jurisdiction. But if you were paying close attention in February and early March of 2011, when the Security Council adopted um, Resolution 1970, uh, uh, triggering the jurisdiction of the court, the prosecutor, about three or four days later, said, I accept that. And uh, the first time the prosecutor did this, when the Security Council triggered the jurisdiction in Darfur, a lot of people said, well, what's that? Why is the prosecutor doing that? And some people said the prosecutor has to proceed when the Security Council triggers the jurisdiction. But the prosecutor was making the point that, no, they don't have to proceed because the Security Council triggers the jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, I think that's the correct view of the statute. And in fact, there are many people, many court insiders now, who are saying the prosecutor should have refused. The prosecutor said, no, I don't, I don't want to do this. Because the Security Council triggers for uh, Darfur and for Libya have, may have distorted the agenda of the court. Uh, there's a sense that maybe they weren't really great for the court, those two episodes in triggering. Uh, particularly because when the first one was adopted, and it's, it's in the second resolution as well, there are some very questionable paragraphs in there, legally questionable. We know where they came from. They have the fingerprints of John Bolton on them, who was the permanent representative of the United States to the United Nations. I, he wasn't the permanent, he was a temporary representative. I don't think he was ever made the permanent representative. Uh, but he was the representative of the United States at the UN, uh, the ambassador to the UN. In, at the time of the first resolution, and he put these paragraphs in there as conditions for their adoption that are <laughs> illegal, and the prosecutor might have said, take them back. But the prosecutor did But the, the point I want to make here only is that the prosecutor has to agree, and that's what the prosecutor did. Uh, and the same with when states trigger the jurisdiction. And of course, the prosecutor herself can trigger the jurisdiction, and we have examples of that Kenya, uh, you know, a train wreck for the International Criminal Court, it looks like. It's very uncertain what's going to happen with the Kenya prosecution. But that was triggered by the prosecutor, and there can be other cases as well. All of this to say that it's ultimately the prosecutor who decides. The prosecutor replaces the security council. She can give the green light to prosecute, but she can also turn on the red light. She can say, I don't want to prosecute there. She ultimately decides. Can I ask a question? Who's the prosecutor actually that you mentioned who said uh, that you would only 
that he agreed with the uh, That was the Luis Mariano Ocampo. Ocampo. That's February. That was in February of 2011. So it was still Luis Mariano Ocampo who agreed. Uh, and he, he finished his term in, uh, in June of 2012. So since that's now since June of 2012. So they could, so, so, and I, I, I certainly agree with that. I think that that's, that it is ultimately, so when I said 10 years ago, I, I didn't fully understand this, I think. I, I, I believe I do now, which is the prosecutor has the ultimate power over where the court operates and where it doesn't operate. So the question is, on what basis does she make her decisions? Mm -hmm. And uh, you can look through the Rome statute. There's no, there are no instructions. There are no, there are indications about what's required for a case to be admissible. There are indications about the jurisdiction, and obviously the prosecutor is wasting her time to try and proceed in an area where she doesn't have jurisdiction. So though that's certainly, there are, there, are, there are those kinds of limits of the statute. But once you have, and, and we could do this exercise, I, I did it uh, this morning when I was teaching international criminal law at Sciences Po in Paris, and I gave all the students in the class a piece of paper, and I said, will you write on a piece of paper the situation that you think should be the priority for the prosecutor of the international criminal court? <laughs> And uh, I collected them all. And uh, I did the same thing a, a week ago at another university. It's a very interesting exercise. I'm convinced, I mean, it would be, I'm convinced it would be a similar result here. We get about, how many are we? 30 people, 35 people. We get about 20 different proposals. And they'd all be good. They would all tick the boxes of the Rome statute for jurisdiction and for admissibility. They'd all be acceptable. The problem is the prosecutor of the court can't prosecute 15 or 20 situations. Uh, doesn't have the resources, the means to do it. So the prosecutor has to pick out of that pool of 15 or 20, and there are more as well, has to decide which ones to prosecute. And the statute doesn't give any direction. Doesn't tell the prosecutor how to, how to select. If you ask the prosecutor, you say, well, I picked the more serious one. But, as I say, 35 people here, you would all think your one is the most serious. And yet they'd be different. Um, some people say, Palestine, that's the most serious. I think Syria, or Afghanistan, or Colombia, or, or uh, Mexico. And by the way, I'm convinced that it would vary as well, depending on where we do the exercise. So if I were to do the exercise, in, if I if I went to give my lecture in Mexico City at a university, there'd be more Latin Americans. Um, it's all legitimate. Our selections. I would have my own personal preferences as well. But our our is are our choices any better than those of the prosecutor? And if she doesn't have any guidance from the statute, on what basis? So what we did was create an independent prosecutor, guaranteed the independence but have no control over it. And we're dependent really on the, the individual for the choices. And I think this is the, on the one hand, it's the beauty of the institution. Uh, you have someone who is there in office for nine years, cannot be easily removed. Uh, we know the circumstance, we know where the red lines are for the prosecutor. So has that independence and impartiality. Uh, but at the same time, um, needs to, in making those choices, ensure that she has credibility. They have to be credible. They have to be acceptable to global, to the world community, to global civil society, if you want. And the problem that the court is confronting now is that some countries don't find them acceptable. You, I don't need to draw you a map to tell you where. Um, and and this is the, this is the, this is the challenge that's now facing the court. Um, I don't think that the prosecutor can find a, a common denominator that's going to please everybody any more than we, we might in this room, certainly if we had an international conference. Well, couldn't we agree on what's the most important and we'd have some people saying, well, no, we can't. Because some think that, that 
prosecuting Tony Blair for uh, war crimes in Iraq <laughs> ought to be at the top of the list, and other people think prosecuting Netanyahu for settlements ought to be at the top of the list, and other people think that prosecuting um, uh, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta for the post-election violence in Kenya ought to be at the top of the list. And it depends. Not in the sense that the prosecutor is on the, you know, on the on the on their mobile has a you know speed dial with the head of the CIA or anything like that. I'm not suggesting that. But the problem is that since she has, I don't know that there's another official in an international organization anywhere in the international uh, international organizations with that kind of power. Not accountable. Uh, discretionary decisions that dictate the priorities of an institution that's worth about 100 million a year. So this is the, this is the challenge. It's, it was premised in the 1990s on a model that came from human rights law from an environment where you have the rule of law and where you have a presumption uh, in domestic jurisdictions that every serious crime against the person is going to be prosecuted. So then it works. Then you have an independent prosecutor and you don't have to steer them. You just say, you prosecute everything serious, and we know that that actually human rights law says that we have to do it. If you don't do it, you're going to have a case at the European Court of Human Rights. But at the international level, you can't do all the cases. So, so this is the, the challenge facing the, the court. And, and I think, as I say, you can't please everybody uh, all the time. Ten years ago, Africa loved the court and the U.S. hated it. Um, and now, Africa is lukewarm about the court, and the U.S. loves it. And we had this bizarre situation last week when, uh, when uh, some African states asked for a resolution in the Security Council to stop the trial of Kenyatta. And campaigning to prevent that were Samantha Power, the U.S. ambassador to the United, to the, to the United Nations, and the New York Times, which is writing editorials on the subject. There, here we have a, a state that hasn't even joined the court that is controlling the agenda of, of the court. I think if someone was looking the, the way we often look at, at constitutional courts, and people say, well, there are the great constitutional courts of the world, um, and then there are the others, and uh, so right at the top uh, would be the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the appeals chambers, some great jurists, of rich experience, and. Uh, you know, with a with very, very impressive body of case law. Uh, they've been fighting the judges in the last year or so. Uh, they've been quarreling, and there are these controversial judgments with uh, important dissents. And uh, so I wanted to say a few words about the, the, two, the, two, most, the, the two most important of, of those judgments. The first one is, is about a year old now, uh, and uh, the case is called the Gotovina. Gotovina was the uh, Croatian general who was sent by President Tudjman in 1995 to uh, free the what's called the Kraina of Serb control. Kraina is a, is a region of Croatia. It's on the border, really, between Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And it had a mixed population and had a, quite a large Serb population. So when the war began in uh, 1992, that part was taken over by Serbs, by Croatian Serbs, Serbs in Croatia, not by Serbia, but by Croatian Serbs. And they ran an autonomous Serb-controlled government that had links with, uh, with Serbia, but they were links rather like the Bosnian Serbs. In other words, there was tension between them as well, but it was, they were ethnically Serbs, certainly. And uh, in uh, 1995, uh, at the beginning of August, as uh, the war was clearly coming to a kind of a, a crisis, but also to an end, uh, the United States pretty much gave the, uh, gave the okay to the Croats and even gave the military assistance as well and said, now's your chance, go and liberate that area. Tuchman, the president of Croatia at the time, called a meeting on an island at Adriatic called Brioni, and he said things like, you know, let's rid this territory of Serbs. And what resulted was probably the single greatest episode of ethnic cleansing in the whole war. <coughs> uh, a 
over the space of three or four days, about 100,000 Serbs, perhaps more, were driven out of the territory, or left. The Serbs say they were driven out, the Croats say that they left. It's like all of the ethnic times. Um, and uh, Gotovina was the general. He was in charge of military commander of the, of the, of the, of the, of the war which was in many ways a conventional war. So they went outside the towns and they shelled them with artillery. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't like a lot of the conflict in Bosnia and Herzegovina where you have sort of gangs of paramilitaries go in and terrorize a town. Or this was a military engagement. And so they attacked the towns with uh, artillery and they were prosecuted for, um, the, for the use of artillery to essentially terrorize the civilian population. Because uh, the, as the bombs were falling on the towns, the Serbs in the towns said, we better get the hell out of here, they're going to kill us, they're going to wipe us out. And they had, they, whether that was a realistic apprehension or not, was, nobody will know perhaps, but they certainly felt that. And so they started to prepare their, uh, they, they, they fled. Um, at the trial, Gotovina was convicted, and the judges said, the issue we have to decide is, is, is it's not an issue of human rights law so much as an issue of the law of armed conflict. Um, if you're shelling a town, you're inevitably going to have collateral damage. Can you shell a town? Can you shell a town under, under the law of armed conflict? Can you shell a town under the law of human rights? You might get a different answer depending on whether it's human rights law or the law of armed conflict that's, that's being applied. One of, if, you, if you look at some of the judgments, particularly from the International Court of Justice, they suggest that the law of armed conflict and human rights law are kind of a seamless, coherent body of law, but I don't think that's true. I think you may get different answers. Uh, so the, the military say, well, we're going to follow the law of armed conflict and we're going to shell Military objectives, that's clear, nobody disputes that, but they can only shell military objectives. The problem is, they don't always hit the military objectives. Sometimes they're wide of the mark. Sometimes they hit non-military objectives, that is civilians. Now, they can't target civilians. They can't target civilians. So how do you tell? Someone's got their cannon there, and they're firing on a town, and there's a barracks there, there's the Ministry of Defense, so there's some military objective, but they miss. And they hit the civilians, and the terrified civilians flee, which is what civilians do when the bombs are raining down on them. And the generals say, well, we're not targeting you, you just, you just happen to be there in the town. And so what do you do if you're a civilian? You run, for, you run like hell to get out of there, you leave. And as happened with the Serbs there, they never came back. So Gautavin is convicted. What the trial chamber did was they said, listen, we're going to uh, create a kind of a presumption that if the shells fall more than 200 meters from a military objective, um, there'll be a presumption that, in effect, this was uh, uh, arbitrary. And that, in fact, you were probably targeting civilians. But you weren't targeting any. You're just dropping shells into a city because you're not really out to defeat the military. You're out there also to cleanse the city and terrify the civilians. So uh, there he's convicted, he goes on appeal, and uh, the judges split three to two. They are intensely lobbied by military establishments. So there are military experts who are, who are appalled at this judgment, who say, but this is going to greatly restrict our freedom to attack civilian so sentence. Like, um, the Israeli military is not very happy about this because, as you know, they have a penchant for sometimes dropping bombs on the towns and urban centers. Uh, the American military doesn't like it. The Turkish military doesn't like it. And so there are, uh, there's lobbying that goes on. There are experts or anarchist briefs that are submitted to the judges. And finally, they split three to two. Uh, two of them, of the, might of the, the three in the majority, overturn the decision. They say, 200 meters, it's just arbitrary. Where did that come from? Who made up that rule? They say, that rule is no good. <coughs> As one of the dissenting judges say, but you have to tell us what the rule is then. You can't just rip it up and say there's no rule. But that's what they do. You have two very, very uh, 
uh, eloquent, persuasive dis dissents. One is from a, a, someone who has a very great pedigree in human rights law, Fausto Pokar, who was a member of the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations for many years. He was the chairman of the, of the Human Rights Committee for, I think, two years, and uh, someone with a, with a great you know, uh, profile. I have to admit, though, that of the majority judges, the president of the, of the appeals chamber, Theodore Meron, was also someone with a, with a good human rights record. He wrote some wonderful books about human rights back in the 1980s. And so we have this, this decision, which I think is a very troubling decision. Uh, the fact is that you know, nobody has now been, nobody's been convicted at the Yugoslavia tribunal for the single most significant episode of ethnic cleansing uh, in the entire conflict, which was done. They call it Operation Storm. That's the first judgment. And it, it led also in the Yugoslavia tribunal to a lot of tension. Meron and Pokar were once great pals and were very close. Now they don't talk to each other. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a real malaise there among some of the judges at, at the tribunal and uh, a great deal of tension amongst them. Uh, and this became public. Uh, people around them, the tribunal knew this, but it became public about three months ago when a Danish judge at the court uh, wrote some, uh, wrote a, a letter, a, an open letter to 50 or 60 of his friends that he sent out by email. He said it was to be confidential and to make sure that no one read it uh, outside of his inner circle. He wrote it in Danish. But, you know, Google Translate, you know. <laughs> We can all read it, and uh, it, it, it made the front page of the New York Times the next day. Uh, and uh, he's now uh, uh, left the tribunal. They disciplined him for doing this. He was declared to be uh, uh, lacking impartiality in a trial that was involved, in, and uh, he's, he's left the Hague, gone back to Denmark. So, so that what I'm telling you is not not, conf it's not gossip. It's not confidential. It's all quite visible in public, and, and quite un unpleasant and ugly. The other decision is from, I think it's February of uh, this year, and uh, it's called the Perisic decision. And Perisic is, uh, Perisic was a Serb. Perisic was a Serb military commander. So it's all about military commanders, these cases. Perisic is the, is a leading Serb military, a Serb, not a Bosnian Serb, but a Serb in Serbia. He's in Belgrade. And he's supporting the Bosnian Serb. Uh, and uh, the Bosnian Serbs, and it's well known, and again, this is a conjecture, it's in the case law of the tribunal, it's well established that the Bosnian Serbs, including their leaders, people like Mladic, uh, are committing atrocities. And the Serbs in Serbia are supporting them. They're providing them with weapons, with financial support, uh, they're providing them with a whole lot of, of support. And uh, the court says uh, in a decision, again, that's a, a split decision. Uh, Pokar is in furious dissent in this decision. Uh, but the judge who had, who had been with Pokar in the Gotovina decision is with Meron in the Parisish decision, Judge Ajus, the vice president of the court from Malta. Um, and there the, they say that you can't convict Parisish, this is an appeal as well, he's been, uh, he's been convicted on that. Trial, and they say you can't convict someone for complicity because it's a complicity case. He didn't actually commit the atrocities in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina himself. He was aiding and abetting someone who's committing atrocities knowing that the atrocities are being committed. And what the appeals chamber says is that's not enough to convict someone for aiding and abetting. To convict someone for aiding and abetting, there has to be evidence that they specifically directed them to uh, commit the, the, the crimes, that, that they specifically directed their assistance to the commission of the crime. You can't just convict somebody for <laughs> helping the Bosnian Serb side in the conflict absent evidence that they're actually specifically directing their support to the perpetration of atrocities. And this is a message that I think uh, a lot of people in the human rights circles find the uh, unpalatable message, um, partly because in the human rights law we we want to we want to enhance the deterrent effect of the law, so we want to to say don't even come close to those people committing the atrocities, or or you may be caught in the net 
as well. Uh, it's of particular interest. This decision is particularly troubling for those who are trying to develop the law on corporate responsibility, corporations, the financial side, because you have corporations that are active in conflict regions, and uh, corporations say, well, yeah, we're doing business there, we're helping uh, the economy, we're contributing in this way and that way, and uh, people in the corporate social responsibility business want to say, well, you shouldn't be there in the first place, you shouldn't be helping them, because they're committing atrocities. So the Perisic decision is saying that as long as you're not specifically directing this to the atrocities, it's going too far to convict you of the crime. And there was an interesting twist on this from another quarter that is, again, not strictly speaking within our human rights frame, but, but very undoubtedly uh, a close relative of human rights law, if not part of the system, which is refugee law. Um, I was at a session earlier this year, a refugee law specialist uh, held at the University of Michigan. And they were very concerned about developments in international criminal law, uh, specifically with regard to complicity. They liked the Parisish decision. They liked it very much. But they didn't like a lot of other decisions in international criminal law because they said, you may know this from refugee law, we have the the definition of who's a refugee in Article 1, and we have the exclusion clauses in Article 1 of the Refugee Convention, which say that if there are grounds to suspect that you have committed a war crime or a crime against humanity, that you're excluded from the protection of refugees. And the refugee tribunals interpret this to mean complicity or aiding and abetting in crimes against humanity and war crimes. Um, and so the concern of the refugee lawyers, they say, this is casting the net too broadly. I, I was not prepared for that, personally, although I've come to understand and appreciate the, the, the wisdom of their, of their view. They're, they're concerned also with protection, and they're concerned that if we, if we make it too easy to, to convict people of, of being accomplices in, in uh, <coughs> war crimes, that, that ultimately will have perverse effects on the protection of the vulnerable um, that they were the examples they were giving giving me is uh, someone from Gaza who gives money to Hamas because they come around and collect money and they support them and give money and there are refugee tribunals that would say you're out you're you're an accomplice to atrocities because you're aiding a terrorist organization or, that, or an organization that's committing these crimes. There was a judgment of the Supreme Court of Canada on this in June of this year. Ezokola is the name of the judgment. Um, Supreme Court of Canada, one of our great constitutional courts, um, you know, with a, a, a reputation for, for issuing very important and influential decisions that go well beyond the, the national <laughs> sphere. And they looked at all of this complicity law and said, it's going too far. And they said, it's having perverse effects on, on refugees. The case, Ezra Kola was a Congolese diplomat. He was working at the UN mission in New York and uh, he was working for the government of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, knowing that the, Democrat, the government of the Democratic Republic of the Congo was committing atrocities in various parts of the country. And uh, one day, Ezekola left a letter on his desk and never came back to work. He went to Canada, made a refugee claim, and the refugee tribunal said, ah, oh, but you're a senior official in a government that's committing atrocities. There's no way that you can make a refugee claim. And the Supreme Court of Canada said, you know, we don't have any evidence that they're making a specific contribution to the atrocities. It's going too far to catch him in that, that net. So this is, I just, I'm watching all this law unfold, and I think it is fascinating <coughs> that these different areas of, of international law are interacting, human rights law, refugee law, international criminal law, um, perhaps pursuing different objectives, perhaps entirely compatible ones, I don't know where it all is. So that's the end. Great, really, thanks, Bill. Um, now that we have uh, we have some time for questions, so we would like to ask the first question. What is the most difficult question to ask? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> what would have happened if the plea of the African leaders had been accepted by the United Nations Security Council? And this sent a message to the prosecutor to um, suspend the prosecutor, to suspend prosecuting this, this leader. I mean, 
Would that be binding on the prosecutor? Yes, it would be. Um, uh, this was what happened on Friday. There was a proposal for a resolution of the Security Council. The Rome Statute specifically provides that the Security Council can adopt a resolution suspending the prosecution. So when I mentioned that the court has become detached from the Security Council, but not entirely free of it, this is one of the places where it's not entirely free of it. The Security Council can, uh, can adopt such a resolution. So it's clear from the Rome Statute that the prosecution <coughs> is bound by such a resolution. Um, and and uh, so the resolution was proposed, I think, by Rwanda, and uh, it got seven votes. Uh, the other states abstained. Nobody voted against it. They didn't need to because they didn't have the nine votes. Um, you know, was that a, I mean, Kenya, the, the short answer to the Kenyans is, you join the court, it's in the statute, you know, you can't complain that you, you know, this couldn't have happened. At the same time, uh, I think the problem is that the, the, the prosecutor herself, who has, the, has this huge discretion, really, as I mentioned, um, I would prefer a court where the prosecutor acknowledges the political uh, dimension of her position and says, yes, and I can deal with those issues myself. I don't need to go to New York. I don't need that part in the statute because what, what, the, what the last prosecutor said, the first, this one has not said it, but she was his deputy and <coughs> hasn't said that what he said wasn't true either. He said, you know, when the court, when there's a political challenge to the court like this, the answer is in the statute, we go to the Security Council. It was as if the court and the Security Council are part of a coherent package. Uh, and I don't think that that's an accurate reflection of what the... Or certainly it's not a vision of the court that a lot of states had. I think most of the states that joined the court said, we will hold our nose about those provisions that recognize the Security Council. We prefer they're not there. They were done as a compromise so that the UK and France would join the court. But really, uh, we shouldn't have them at all. There shouldn't be any Security Council involvement in the court. Um, and that the court should be able to, should be a self-contained unit capable of dealing with these issues. Instead, the prosecutors have said, oh, that's for New York, that's for the Security Council. I think this is part of the malaise with countries like Africa, and it certainly means we'll never get the Arab states to join, because they say, so finally you're hooked up with the Security Council. That's what this court is. And that's the, but it's, you know, you can interpret the statute that way, but certainly the point is that the prosecutor would have been required under the, the law of the statute to stop the prosecution. And somewhat related to that question, you say that the prosecutor has absolute power to decide who to prosecute or not because they have the final decision, but how often does she decide to not prosecute based on a, a suggestion of the Security Council? She's never done it. Well, that hasn't happened yet. And the state party? <laughs> she hasn't done it yet, but she will do it soon, I think. Um, because she's had, a, a, she's had a, a, a referral by a state party that she, I'm sure, doesn't want to do anything with. It's not really very, it's an interesting referral, but she's not going to do anything with it. It's a Comoros who refers the Gaza flotilla. Um, part of the Gaza flotilla, because some of the ships in the Gaza Flotilla, about three years ago, were, were flagged with, by, to state parties, including Comoros. They had a ship there. And so that's the territory of a state party, the, the ship with the flag. And so they say, look, they have jurisdiction. The court has jurisdiction. And so Comoros has requested the court. And I mean, I, I bet, I'll, I'll bet anybody 100 euro right now that she's going to say uh, no. <laughs> I had one of the pants to spare with that. Uh, but I think you better have it to spare because you will lose it. Yeah, <laughs> so I think I'm going to abstain. Um, any, anyone else? Really, really interesting topic. I enjoyed it very much. But in the case where the, the state are the one making the, the crimes, so that one committing the crimes. Again, it's vulnerable people, again, it may be minority. As in the case of Uganda, the government of Uganda rushed so bad to sign and ratify <coughs> the ICC treaty so he can refer the, the aid of the NRA, but he too was committing the same crimes. 
So what are the justif um, justification in that? You say he, you mean Musa? Musa, you need to talk to Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely in agreement with you. Um, the Ugandan government was the first state to refer uh, a situation to the court. Uh, it was a bit concocted by the prosecutor and the, and the Ugandan government. Uh, Uganda made a, issued a declaration. I suspect that it was drafted in the hate in the prosecutor's office and was that the signed it. Um, there was, they, they announced it here in, in London, at, uh, I think at the Hilton uh, Park Lane, and they, they had a press conference in December of, of 2003, and they said, you know, now the first triggering of the jurisdiction of the court, and the declaration said, the Lord Justice is our And the prosecutor was very happy with that. He went back to the Hague, and uh, his uh, assistant said, you know, there's something wrong with that. You can't trigger against one group. You can trigger a territory. And so the prosecutor issued kind of a correction a few weeks later. and said, actually, uh, I will interpret this as covering northern Uganda. Mm -hmm. We can't just target it against the Lord Jesus. Um, then, uh, a year and a half later, uh, the prosecutor applied for five arrest warrants, Coney and four others from the LRA. And the arrest warrants were uh, issued by the court, but they were secret at first, and then they were made public in October of 2005. Uh, and at the time, the human rights NGOs, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and the others, were very critical of the prosecutor. They said, why are you only prosecuting one side? And the prosecutor said, well, because, uh, and this was the first uh, attempt at a, a rationalization by the prosecutor for these selection decisions. The prosecutor said, because they're, they're killing more people, so it's more serious. He says, it's gravity. And, uh, you know, it was a contrived explanation. Um, you know, you don't decide whether something's serious just by the numbers involved. Uh, I think. It's always more serious when it's the government killing you than when it's the rebels. I mean, the rebels, that's their job. That's what they do, is go up and arrest you know, <laughs> But the government's supposed to protect you. So if the government's committing atrocities, it's inherently more serious. The prosecutor said, oh, well, I'm going to get to them next. He said, but I have to start here because it's more serious, and then we'll get to them. And that was eight years ago. And he still never got to them. But between Ju July to 2002 and July like to 2005, the government itself intend intensified the attack on the civilians. So, you know, because the LRA did not have the logistic or the manpower or the resources to do that. Yes. Well, as I say, these are, are the prosecutor has discretion, and these are decisions that are based on, you can ask. On what basis but that choice was made? We just don't know. I mean, this is the problem when you give a function to someone without framing it in terms of the, the, the criteria they're supposed to apply, and they're not accountable. So you just don't know. Does the, 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 does the prosecutor does the prosecutor get instructions from a from an intelligence service that calls calls them up or calls her up and tells you to prosecute? Does the prosecutor come to London and go to a fortune teller and come and garden every six months and say, where should I go now? I mean, you don't know. Do, do they take those pieces of paper that I get from my students, throw them in a hat? You just don't know. It's not. Because they're, all of these, can we say that the Lord's Resistance Army don't deserve to be punished? Of course not. They, they're committing atrocities. They deserve to be prosecuted. So does Ms. Emily. So why? And ultimately, it's a it's a political choice. I just don't know where the politics come from, which I think is the, is the problem with the court. I'll just ask: Does the prosecutor have to use the justification of what what they're taking on? Is it written down in are there, are there documents as to the decision making process at all, or where is there sort of information about this? Or no, it's just nowhere. No, there's nothing public. There are attempts when the you see the prosecutor. When the prosecutor goes, the prosecutor has to get authorization. If, if she wants to prosecute on her own initiative a situation, which she did with Kenya, or her predecessor did, they have to go before three judges 
of a, what's called a pretrial chamber and get the judges to give them their blessing for it. But it's a, we have a decision on that. It's a very perfunctory decision where the judges look at the, at the technical stuff. Do you have jurisdiction? Is it technically acceptable? They don't look at the, the wisdom or the politics behind the decision, uh, nor do they have the basis to do it, because really the only way you can assess the politics of it is not by whom she's prosecuted. It's like you, you can't say that prosecuting the Lord Resistance Army is politically driven if all you do is look at the LRA. Of course they deserve to be prosecuted. Of course Comey deserves to be prosecuted. The only way you can tell that there's something a bit distorted or perverse about it is if you say, but why isn't Museveni prosecuted? So, but the, the, the prosecutor doesn't do that. She says, oh, I'm going to go there because it's serious. But we don't know where she's not going and why she's not going. That's all. And they, they've given, uh, you know, uh, outside of the law, the prosecutor, when he said to the NGOs, I'm going to get to the Museveni and the Ugandan government later, he didn't have to say that. He just could have said, I don't have to answer those things. But he, we get a little bit of explanation. It's just not very convincing. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you very much. It was a very interesting and enlightening talk. Um, I, for one, enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, my question is slightly different. Um, do you foresee any significant expansion, both in terms of the institution itself and the scope of the work that it undertakes in, in the future? Uh, I remember at the end of the Rome Conference, the legal advisor of the UK, Frank Berman, took the floor to say, you can never exercise jurisdiction over aggression without Security Council approval. And uh, we had the same thing at the conference in Kampala in uh, 2010 when the amendment was adopted and the representative of the, U of the UK, Christopher Wormsley, was, he said, this is impossible. He said, this is changing the charter of the United Nations. You can't give the court jurisdiction over the crime of aggression and not let the Security Council decide when it's going to prosecute or not. He said, it's unthinkable that you do this. But then, a few days later, the amendment was proposed, and the, the chair said, does anyone call for a vote? And all that the British delegate had to do was say, I call for a vote. And it would have been enough to sabotage the amendment. And he sat on his hands and did the same. So, um, I, I don't think there'll be moves to add other, other crimes. Or it, 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 there may be a little bit of tweaking, fine-tuning to it, but nothing major. The big... Uh, holes, uh, or the big issues, the big proposals for adding jurisdiction to the International Criminal Court have been categories of crimes like terrorism, international drug crimes, and piracy. I don't really see any of that happening anytime soon. Um, I, I say about the drug crimes, the international drug crimes. I mean, you look at a court that can do a couple of trials in a decade. Um, I can't imagine taking on international drug trafficking. I say with from their headquarters in The Hague, I don't think they could prosecute the international drug crimes that are committed within 250 meters of the, <laughs> of the headquarters in The Hague, let alone take on the planet. You know. So I, I don't see that, that happening. There are periodic attempts to, to enlarge the jurisdiction. I think there's a recognition that the ICC is, uh, it has enough to keep itself busy. It doesn't need any new crimes. And there's a growing sense of frustration that it's, it's underperforming. Different theories about where the problems lie, and maybe like a lot of institutions, it's a, a, it's complex. There are many explanations. There are many many factors uh, that that are explaining that that, have, that help to explain it and help us to understand it. But whatever the explanation, there's a there's a frustration because of, no one quite knows how to how to fix it or how to get agreement on how to how to fix it, and it's just underperforming. And so I would expect that in the next decade or so, that there'll be a revival in interest in setting up uh, temporary institutions, ad hoc tribunals, uh, in some form or another. That, that that's the, the original dream was those institutions had their day and they would die out because the ICC would take over. And it's, it's clearly, right now, not capable of doing it. It's, it's going through a very prolonged, is it, is it uh, infancy or adolescence? Uh, I don't really know how to describe it, but you know, it's, it's not fully grown yet. Yeah. 
perhaps could be that the reason is simply that the, the key stakeholders have no interest in actually having to face a well-functioning and well-resourced international criminal court. You know, the, yes, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of, I mean, the, the, the main stakeholder, again, is not even a member of the court, is the, United States, is the United States, and no other country has been more enthusiastic about international justice. Really, going back to Nuremberg. But is that not ironic, given Guantanamo drone strikes, <laughs> the lack of UN mandates on the invasion of Afghanistan, you know, drone, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. But it's not very well. They yeah. just don't. They want justice for other people. <laughs> you know? I, I mean, I think one of the most, uh, the most hypocritical things that's going on right now is that there was, there was a decision. The, the latest tribunal, by the way. Uh, it's outside of the ICC sphere. It couldn't be, it couldn't deal with the ICC, it couldn't be before the ICC because the crimes took place before 2002, which is when the temporal jurisdiction begins. I'm talking about Hissan Habrik, the former dictator of Chad. He's been in Senegal for many years, and uh, some years ago, Belgium said, well, you send him to Belgium, we'll try it. And Senegal said, no, thanks, no, we're not going to send him, he's, he's staying here. He was a friend of the president, he was giving money to the president. And uh, so Belgium took, uh, took uh, Senegal to the International Court of Justice, which ruled uh, not quite a year and a half ago in an interesting decision. But under the torture convention, <coughs> there was an obligation to prosecute the crime of torture. And that, that Senegal was not fulfilling its obligations under the torture convention, and therefore, uh, uh, well, they, they ruled against Senegal. And so Senegal cleaned up its act. It's organizing a trial now, and the United States is giving them money and support, logistical support, and they're they're gung ho about it. They think it's a great trial. Now Belgium hasn't taken the United States to the International Court of Justice for the failure to prosecute Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney for for torture. Uh, you know, President Obama, when he took office, acknowledged the torture had been committed. It's not like it's a secret. But President. If, if, I heard a senior general from the U.S. Navy speaking at West Point at the U.S. Military Academy a couple of years ago, and he said, he said, there's no doubt that torture was committed. Everybody knows this. He said, we know who did it. And he said, the only question we don't know is whether they'll be held accountable. Of course, Obama made a statement when he took office saying, yes, we won't do it. You know, you know the film, uh, Zero, what's it called? Zero Dark Clarity. I mean, you see it quite dramatically when they, when the torturers start complaining that, you know, the new guy took office, so now we can't torture people anymore. <laughs> of course, then they just figure out another way to get the information and finally catch the, the bad guys, but uh, and, and find out where Bin Laden is. But the point is, Obama says we're going to stop doing it, and I, I think there definitely was a significant change uh, with the Obama administration. Except he said, but we're not going to prosecute. So, I, I mean, I'm, I get sick of doing this. I go to conferences and I hear these American diplomats and people in the U.S. government talk about how great it is that Senegal is prosecuting this and how they're going to help them and give them money. And here they are just standing as a monument to impunity for, for torture. And Belgium, which could be, Belgium is great for being holier than now with African countries. They love taking them to the International Court of Justice, teaching them lessons. I mean, they did it through the 19th century. They keep doing it, but they, you know. Okay, well, yeah. We asked when I was on the Truth Commission in Sierra Leone. We 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 tried. We couldn't quite get the evidence of this that the the um, the chopping off of hands in West Africa had been learned from the Belgians in the Congo. We've all seen the pictures. Next time for an additional question. No more questions. Um, I have to say, Bion has an EU lawyer. I've learned a lot tonight. He was fascinating. He was so fascinating that I think I might just give up on EU law and switch to international criminal law. It sounds so much more exciting. Um, so many thanks, Bion. We are very grateful for you taking the time to talk to us tonight. It's also, I mean, we should be especially grateful because today is Bion's birthday. He <laughs> took the time on this busy schedule to come and talk to us. So, Bill, we're very grateful. Thank you.